the purpose of this video today is to present a visual representation of the New Zealand freshwater fish sampling protocols. These were designed a few years ago uh, and the idea of, of this video is to, is to show how specifically for the electric fishing protocols um, how you undertake consistent and robust sampling of fish communities in weightable rivers. Some research has gone into identifying the optimum length of river to fish so that you can effectively characterise the reach scale diversity of fish that you're likely to find in rivers. That work showed that at around about 150 lineal metres of river you have more than a 90% chance of detecting the species that are like to, likely to be present. And for this reason, uh, this is why we, we sample 150 metres as a minimum. And the idea is to collect consistent information at a national and a regional scale so that we can better understand fish communities in New Zealand. As part of these videos, we'll also document the use of an electronic data capture system, which is used to minimise transcription errors and also improve the efficiency with, uh, within which the information is collected. By ensuring that the information is, is installed in, in this manner, it also means that the data can be uploaded to corporate databases and then analyses be conducted at a national scale. Okay, so what we're going to do is cover off the main components within the fish kit. There's quite a, a few components here, but we're just going to focus on the main ones. Much of the gear is self-explanatory, um, and most of the details for the use of the other bits can be found in the National Fish Sampling Protocols booklet. These are standards that we use to mark out the different sub-reaches um, on, on the riverbed. This is a meter that measures temperature and conductivity um, for helping to uh, select the appropriate settings on the machine. A Toughbook electronic data capture system here uh, which records all of the data um, in the field um, and we've also got a backup copy uh, of hard copy in case you run out of batteries or you have a, a system malfunction there. Polaroid glasses, which are crucial for cutting out glare and enabling good visibility when undertaking fishing. Uh, a little aquarium jar here, uh, which is also useful for IDs. Fish stick up their fins and you can identify them easier in a little glass um, jar like that. We have fish anaesthetic, which is uh, aqueous to knock out eels. Um, and also other fish like enunga and smelt, which are very flighty and difficult to measure three buckets, one which is normally for small native fish, one bucket which normally has anaesthetics in it to process eels as they're very difficult to handle, and a third either recovery or transport bucket that can move backwards and forwards between the, uh, the fisherman and the pole netter. Um, because the hands are close to the water when using the pole net, it's advised to use these insulating gloves so that you don't get an electric shock from the machine when it's in the uh, when it's in the water operating. Okay, so we've arrived on site. Uh, it's a site we haven't been to before. So the first thing that we do is we walk the entire reach that we're thinking of sampling, and we undertake an assessment of which method to use using the decision support table. This helps us guide um, the best method to use for the waterway. In this case, it's come out as electric fishing. The first thing to do is to accurately find your start position using GPS. Try to get it accurate to within two or three metres and put the first stake in the ground, denoting the start point. Uh, a useful tip is to think about where the stake's going so that it's easily visible by the fishing team when they're in the channel doing the fishing. 15 metres is measured out and then uh, the first subreach stake is put in the ground. So that denotes the end of subreach A. And that's tied off. And then the rest of the site will be continued to be marked out at 30, then 45, and then sub subsequent 15 meter intervals until 150 meters is reached. 
While Kelly finishes out marking the site, other team members will go down to the stream and evaluate water quality, which is a crucial component to ensure the correct settings on the machine are used. So Lauren's currently measuring water temperature and conductivity, and the conductivity values will help Steve determine which settings and which parameters to use for the stream. An important thing to remember when undertaking the water quality measurements is to ensure that the probe doesn't hit sediment on the bottom and that you aren't disturbing the bed, which will give strange results. Well, we'll start with uh, two milliseconds and about 60 hertz. And I'd say about uh, 200 volts is a starting point to test the machine. An important part of the protocols is to ensure that the same settings and effort are used if you're repeat visiting a site. Just keeps things consistent at that site and it, it compares like with like. Okay, I've reset the minutes. If we grab those buckets, we'll be ready to go. An important component before starting fishing is to undertake what we call a toolbox talk, and that's just to identify any particular hazards at the site so that all members are aware of the potential risks that, that could be in the area. Slip reality on these rocks here. Metal, uh, which is a hazard when you um, have electricity in the water. After doing the water quality testing, we've made a selection of settings on the machine. And before we start fishing, we test those settings to make sure we're happy with how they're performing. And we do this immediately downstream of the start point. Fishing. Okay, we're basically looking to immobilize the fish, but not to knock them out too heavily. So there's a fine line between using settings that are too heavy and ones that are ample for, for doing this kind of monitoring. Yeah. Nice shoot. Okay, so we've got some fish there. They look like they're immobilized. And looks like the settings are working quite well. The fish have been immobilised, Steve's just wetting his hands because fish are at the same temperature as the environment around them and of course humans are at 37 degrees so it's important to keep nice wet hands, place the fish in the bucket where they can recover. Paratire. Okay so we've tested the machine, the settings seem to be working quite well. We'll record those settings in our data capture so that we've got them for next time and then we'll actually start fishing the reach properly from here on. First thing we do is we make sure that the machine shock button time is reset to zero because it accumulates time so that we're starting fresh. Steve's tiptoeing his way up to prevent disturbing the bed because that's where they're going to be fishing. The pole netter is making sure that the chain is sitting nice and tight to the bed so that fish can't slip away underneath. And Steve's being very diligent about making sure that the cathode the tail of the machine is positioned between himself and the pole netter. This is very important to ensure that you're fishing with the charge in the area that you're interested in. So we fish these as lanes. Are and you ready? Yeah. Fishing. As they fish down through the lane, Steve will watch for fish to come through. He'll communicate with the pole netter and the pole netter ready? Yeah. will get Stay ready up. to lift the net and check to see if there's any fish inside. Okay, there's a couple of redfin bullies there. Now to ensure that they are consistent and they're not fishing over water that they've already fished before, a really useful tip is to use an in-stream feature to move yourself one pole net width apart so that you're efficiently fishing the entire area but not fishing over water that you've already fished. So Steve's taken that tail, he's repositioned it between himself and the pole netter, and he's repeating the process. And in this case, with a stream this wide, they're able to cover the entire channel with two sets. Okay, so an important part now is that once they clear this net, they will move upstream, and again, Steve will walk in a manner to prevent um, to prevent causing any disturbance to the bed, the pole netter will move to the position where the fisherman was. And in this case, Steve was using the punga on the true left bank there. 
as his marker and he'll use a new marker. In this case, he's pointing at the bank where he's gonna start and he'll work and fish a lane down on the true left bank now. Okay, good communication between the fisherman and the pole netter is essential for both safety and yep. also for being efficient in terms of collecting fish. Nice. Okay, some more fish here. Um, Lauren's using wet hands again to make sure that she's not uh, affecting the fish. And we just keep accumulating these fish in the bucket as we fish through the reach. Again, using the in-stream marker of the punga, Kelly has moved across to the true right of the bank now. Steve again has taken the rat tail over and in this way fishing. very methodically fishing through the reach without fishing any of the same terrain twice. If you see a fish and it's not captured don't stress about it you can continue fishing because the idea is to use a consistent level of effort between subsequent events. The, uh, the person on the bucket that's assisting is always behind the pole netter and the fisherman to ensure that they're not walking over any of the stream bed that's to be fished. The following is a time-lapse demonstration of how to do lane fishing in a consistent and unbiased way. Steve's working his way down towards Kelly, the pole net, and they're methodically moving from one side of the channel to the next using in-stream markers to guide their progress to ensure they're not fishing over the same water again. Each time that they move between different points, the cathode, which is the tail of the machine, is repositioned between the pole netter and the fisherman. The fisherman finds a new marker and the pole netter moves up to the previous point where the electric fisherman was. Communication is a vitally important part of a fishing, an efficient fishing team. Um, in this case, uh, Lauren's pointing out that there's a marker coming up which is the end of the subreach and so that helps the fisherman realize that he's towards the end of his reach so he fishes down through and then seeing as though that's his last run they're now checking the machine shock button time five minutes on the back of the machine which will get entered into the data capture system Steve and Kelly are measuring the wetted width of the channel which is necessary for working out number of fish per meter squared in the reach. We do them at the end of each sub-reach fished. Meanwhile, Lauren pulls out the densiometer and starts to measure canopy cover on the convex mirror. The shade measurements are made at four points uh, at each second sub-reach, one facing upstream, one facing to the true left, one facing downstream, and one facing to the true right bank. The other useful measure at the end of a subreach is to record stream gradient. This is done by placing the net at the upstream end at the water's surface and picking a coloured tape on the, on the net. In this case, they're using the green marker and then matching it up with the inclinometer with uh, an adjacent pole downstream at the beginning of the subreach using the same color and by looking between those two reference points getting an estimate of the stream gradient. Okay at the end of the subreach all fish are processed before moving on to the next subreach. Eels are anesthetized. That species is then selected on the data capture system its length entered and the fish placed in a recovery bucket. So we have a red fin bully. Again, total length is measured from snout to the end of the tail. If the fish has a fork tail, the measurement is made to the middle of the fork. Once the fish are entered and measured, they are then returned back to the stream and placed one pull riffle sequence downstream so that they don't enter the area that we'll be fishing in the subsequent reach. The aquarium is quite useful for helping to ID fish Fish tend to stick up their dorsal fins, which is a, a common characteristic that's used to identify species. In this case, we've got a, a small elva, which can be difficult to identify, but it's, it's fairly obvious when in the tank, this is a short fin elva. 
The other fish there is a redfin bully with characteristic stripes on the cheeks. In this case, we've got a freshwater crayfish and freshwater shrimp. They're not measured in the same way as fish are. So literally just the numbers are counted and then they're placed back in the stream. In the case of the shrimp, they are placed into categories from 1 to 10, 10 to 100, 100 to 1,000 and 1,000 plus. The only other categories that we have for fish are Gambusia. Okay team, looks like we're good to go. Can you just confirm we've got everything for subreach A? Sure, uh, I have wetted width, gradient, uh, shock time and one missed fish. Once you've completed the first subreach and released the fish, continue fishing the rest of the site using the same methodological approach until the following nine subreaches are completed and the full 150 metres has been fished. Once completed the last subreach, make sure that all the data has been captured on the completion page on the data capture system and that all the data fields have been filled in. There's a button to click to ensure that the finish time is recorded and this will give you your total fishing time for the site. It's a good idea to, at this point to save that data and then check that that data has been saved before closing down the machine. After the full completion of the site and return to the truck, it is absolutely vital to undertake decontamination procedures. This is important to ensure that algae, things like fungus and other aquatic plant and animal pests aren't transferred between different sites. Make sure that you're thorough with your decontamination procedures.